Um, my name is Tal, and um, I am in Denmark. You say there's something called the raisin at the end of the sausage. So that's me. I'm the end of today almost. I'm also maybe a little bit the exorcist today, and my technical equipment doesn't work. But maybe it's quite okay, because if I look at the first image, I, the way I did this talk is that every day I wrote down a few things on notes, and I also collected some images. And uh, there is a famous Danish movie saying, one speech and another speech. And I will try to do it in stereo and read a little bit of both of them and try if I can make any sense out of this. So the first picture I would put up there, I simply just Googled naked German people. And there is a people of five men standing like this naked, probably from the 20s, where people were especially, you know, they were into being naked. Um, so. I'm really honored being here today. Uh, also, I'm a little bit confused about it because I have loved the work of Hilma of Klimt for many years. And the thing is that if you really like something, you don't need to know anything about it. And that means I, I was thinking two weeks ago, what could I really say about this? The thing is, the moment you recognize it, the moment you are into it, no more to say. But the reason why I used the word exorcist is that, I mean, we are here to give our love a name. All of us are trying in different ways to explain something very simple. We really, really like it. We really like those paintings, and in different ways, we try to give it a name. But to give something a name is a little bit like when somebody gives a coin like this. You give the coin and you take something. We never know what is given and what is taken at the same time. For instance, if you contextualize it, lies her as being either abstract, not abstract, before, after, middle, it's of course a nice gesture to do, but I fear more for this. I fear more that it also takes something away from these kind of excessive, mad, brilliant misunderstandings of her paintings. So the first thing I wrote, I think this was Monday, so there is still a bit of coffee from Monday, and I changed the pictures. Here, there is a picture of Alfred Jensen, another great artist that went down a path of systems, numbers, and uh, stuff like this. And I, here I wrote Monday, don't fall in the same trap as the artist fell into. So. Speaking about art, the, the experience that I have speaking about art is mostly from teaching. Um, I teach in Dusseldorf, and that's where you, you walk into a class, and there's a student showing you something, and you have to invent the language for this. And over the, I've done it now for maybe nine, ten years. I always try to tell the students, please get as deep into your own decadency as possible, the decadency of being exactly you. And then, you know, some people do this. They get deeper and deeper into this. And the, more, the deeper you get, there, I mean, this is all like a little bit like speaking about like conspiracy, because I don't know if this is the truth. I can only say that's how I see it. At a certain point, when you get deeper into your interest, you get beyond everything written. You just go deeper. You go into what you could, in contemporary terms, call meditation or trance. If you go in there, the most brilliant thing can, that can happen is all the misunderstandings. And it's not meant as criticism saying that Hilma of Clint, as I see it, is just one big misunderstanding of the spiritual world. Misunderstanding may, meant in a very sweet way, because I don't think that there is a way that is the correct understanding of spirits. But all the confusion of going in there and talking to this spirit, talking to that uncle in the corner, that flying being, that's why she became an artist, because all through history, misunderstandings have been great material for creating art. I just saw the other day, I opened a magazine, and there was a, oh, next picture is Jackson Pollock. <laughs> Big Jackson Pollock, they all look the same. And there was a, 
there's now, I think in London, there's a big exhibition called Was Pollock Inspired by Navajo Indians? Or, and Hungarian uh, perspective on Pollock. And in a way, it's not that they are wrong. They also might be, they might be wrong, they might be right. But you can't help laughing. I mean, of course we want to give our appreciation also something, somebody like Jackson Pollock. We want to give it a name and it's unbearable to think that he was drunk and he just stood up and he crossed the point. He crossed it. And the amazing thing about him that he recognized that he crossed this point. Other people could have crossed it before, but he recognized and it repeated and he kept doing it and he established this as something out there. And it's hard for us to accept and to call our love for this nothing. You can't say, I love it. We have to talk about it and give it a name, like with Hilma of Clint. Um, also something that is kind of interesting, at the moment, a lot of shows, there is now, I haven't seen it in Venice, but I heard that there's a lot of this kind of arrogant name, so-called outside art, beside serious conceptual art. Or there is, I saw a show, a beautiful show, with Rosemarie Trockel in New York, where there were, and now a picture of Judith Scott, a woman with uh, Down syndrome, doing amazing sculptures. And um, they were shown beside Rosemary Trockel's work. Why at this weird moment where we have, we have traveled so far in art, you know, bringing in everything is possible, why do we jump to these so-called outsiders, these mad people, these people out of control that talk to demon and ghost? It's a weird thing. And I think also to say why I love Hilma of Clint, why I really love it is because of, you said it before, the excess. This, this kind of uh, very unsweety thing, out of control, late at times. She's Danish, come on, forget it. And um, I mean, it might, I, I also enjoyed a lot the discussion about Robert Fludo, that was the way, and Malevich. Another picture I would show you is Modigliani, the eyes of Modigliani, everybody knows them, black eyes. So you sit there, I do a drawing of you and I, I, I arrive at your eyes. The moment, at a certain point, if I keep drawing you, I would, sooner or later, I would draw black eyes. And then I would say, yeah, yeah, this is, this is just like Modigliani. But the thing is that I think there exists something like chat rooms. Different artists enter a certain kind of debate and they eat from the same material. Maybe afterwards they look alike, but have nothing at all to do with each other. I mean, come on, it's not just a big deal to make a black square. I mean, it, everybody has a spine, has certain amounts of holes, and a square is just everything you don't have on your body. And I'm sure, and you also said something like this, all through history, people have made these kind of squares ever since people could, are able to draw in sand with their toe. Rudolf Steiner, blackboard. I mean, they are these amazing drawings, but the point is that he was not thinking about them as something. They were just a byproduct of something else. And that's also like a really good thing when you want to teach people about learning to do art. It's like don't focus, you know, on the image, on the picture you're painting. Focus on what you are into. And Hilma of Clint was such a brilliant example of somebody, you know, excessive into something. Paintings were just something that happened. Something, yeah, she had a way of saying that people talked to her. But they were second. Rudolf Steiner, weather drawings, also second. It was just about explaining another, all kind of misunderstandings about the ground. And I tell you, why do I, did I put two of my kids to Rudolf Steiner kindergarten and, and daycare? I, every time I went there, oh, next picture, Urut Mi. I love it. This kind of ladies, I, I really love it. But I think most of it, and I'm sorry if I if I really heard any hardcore Steiner fans, I guess most of it's just misunderstandings. But, <laughs> but the thing is, in the Steiner school, for instance, in Denmark, the misunderstanding going that direction created people who really took good care of the kids. They really focused and they took their job very serious. So a lot of people sent there and said, yeah, 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 whatever, eat that corn on Monday, not on Tuesday. <laughs> so Hilma Kent, for me, a little bit similar. It's like, 
her focus was so much this direction that she didn't fall into the trap of doing mediocre paintings. She made so brilliant work because she put all her money on actually the content of just getting lost into all this. And I repeat, I'm quite satisfied with this sentence. Don't fall in the same trap as the artist fell into. If we try to understand it from what she wrote about that ghost and that uncle and that, you know, what happened there, that fire, it won't lead anywhere because it's just her private thing that got her into doing these amazing paintings. So we somehow have to accept that part of the appreciation of her painting is without a name. Um, it's not too bad. Um, another picture. Um, this is a photo of Hermann Hesse. And I tried to ask several people about a book called The Sun. In Danish, it's called Sun and Moon. Maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe I, I read it when I was, the half year I was in high school, I probably read it. But it's about two monks. And sometime in my class, I also have people meditating. I have a lot of people on drugs as well. But you have in this book two monks. And they late in life, they have a discussion. Because they started from this, in the same kind of monastery, but one became a high priest. He went strictly into religion. The other became a painter of icons, an artist. And the, and the priest says, it's good you never became, became a priest like me because you didn't have the mind for it. And in this book, it's kind of beautifully described the, the difference between religion and art. And I, again, it's something I, I'm sure I heard some feelings. I think the practice of religion and the practice of art is very, very different things. And uh, I think the beauty of Hilma's Klint is also her great, beautiful, attractive misunderstanding of everything that just created these images. I actually wrote a title for this talk. Somehow it got lost, and it's probably good. But a few weeks ago, somebody asked me if I, if I had a name for my talk. And I, at that point, had no clue what I could talk about. So I said, mm -mm, the title of my talk is Magic Food. So what is magic food? It's a weird little ironic word that start appearing in the Danish media. Because like in all over Europe, there's this discussion about halal, this special way of uh, cutting meat or butchering. And there's this talk whether we should have this food in the hospital. And suddenly they start saying not halal. There was this guy saying, if they want magic food, let them have magic food. And it's this weird kind of little word that has a kind of sarcasm, but also something sweet about it. If people want magic food, give them magic food. A steak is a steak. And um, I think as an artist, I really appreciate the images you showed before. But I think there's one big mistake you can do as an artist. And that every art, you know, every artist, when they do art, they have a certain idea. And what they do are just examples of these things. But if you go into the imageries and you try to learn from them from the images, you are on a, you're on a wrong track. You have to actually get inside where they create the images. That means your images will look different. That means artists that has nothing in common can be very close inside the machinery. From Hilma and Clint, you can learn excess. Get lost in your own world. Just go in there. Give it whatever name. Call it ghost. Call it your mother. Sub I mean, it's all, it's, all, it's all fine with me. At the end of the day, as long as you are able to create beautiful steps on the dance floor that other people can't do, it's OK. So I make it a little shorter. You made it a little longer. So maybe I, I calm it out. Thank you. At first hand, what we just can, uh, I, I'd like to take up tell her, her a comment whether this kind of, the, the, the really the, the, the fundamental question is of Clint's work, is it art? I, 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 mean, I mean, also Raphael, just you, you, you gave a very plausible um, um, uh, question, but uh, as a Hegelian, I, I would say, say it is more, it is a little bit more, uh, we have to be more dialectic about. Um, <clears throat> which earlier discussed ju just before 
we entered the symposium, uh, the MoMA show, the uh, MoMA exhibition, the actual uh, inventing abstraction were really already in the preface. It has been said, we don't deal with, a, uh, with esoterics. It is excluded. And um, I, I've, at first hand, I, I thought, probably it's, it's just the Greenbergian heritage that you only deal with forms about abstract art, and I think that would be a wrong thing. But on the other hand, Tal Air just showed us what is the difference between art and the works which Hilma um, of Klint has done. Hilma, uh, Hilma took it really serious. I think you, you said she was joking. Uh, she, she, she made, uh, she was, she, but she has this kind of koan jokes, like gurus, you know, that this within meditation and then you make a joke. But uh, that are jokes which are really, they have a goal to, to the whole message. And, it, uh, and what we have heard now, that was really, the, the, the difference which, is, which, which, you, uh, which you make, just uh, the, to differentiate between art and religion. That art has to do with secularization. Art, as we take it for granted, is an act of uh, secularization. I, I just I prepared a very um, elaborate um, PowerPoint, which I will now just, um, uh, in a way, um, uh, sacrifice for our discussion. Well, I, I come back to the question, is it art? I mean, you showed us that our art as a secular um, phenomenon is fundamentally also poetic. I think that's, that's, the, that's the measure the measure aspect of art, it is they may deal, like, like Marcel Duchamp, they may deal with esoterics, but they are fundamentally um, self-referential. It is this kind of translation into an autonom uh, autonomous realm. And I'm really doubting whether uh, these works were really meant to be art in this modern, modernist sense. But on the other hand, um, uh, Hegelian, in, in a way, I mean, it was very plausible what, what you have said. Um, it is not the abstract, abstract um, um, abstraction is not yet art. You have to conceive an idea of uh, ab um, ab um, the abstract as uh, uh, you know, you, 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 the idea, the, the invention of the idea of abstract art. That's this phenomenon, and I think that's this orthopoetic phenomenon, which came then from Robert Flatt to Malevich, to make this kind of uh, uh, black square a piece of art. That I absolutely agree. But on the other hand, what should we then exclude stained glasses of the Middle Ages, which are all not all, all also not be con considered to be art when they had been built, when that they had been um, um, fabricated or altarpieces? And I, I mean, what, what I find so amazing, I mean, I, even this uh, piece uh, I wrote um, an article about, uh, just because it has all in it was this kind of sudden, immediate turn from naturalism to abstract art. That's, that's the way why I find it very in, um, intriguing. But um, I, I'll come to that later. But what I wanted to say, <clears throat> what I was amazed when I saw the, um, the exhibition are the sizes of these pieces. They are absolutely, um, for just for that time, 
absolutely unconventional. And in this sense, I see just in, in the sizes, a sort of autopoiesis, a mandala just for contemplation, just a, a, di a spiritual diagram. You, can, you, you, you went to the Robert Flood, but you can go back to Plato and the Pythagorean diagrams. You know, they, they, are, they, they have a very long tradition since written, um, written philosophy is that there is a huge tradition of the diagrammatic, um, which is not art yet. Uh, but what she did, she makes, in a way probably even not um, conscient, she makes it something orthopoetic, just with this large sizes. I mean, I, I go far away from what I want, would have liked to, to talk about. Um, uh, the, but, Probably, I, I would only to say, uh, probably if you agree, one point which is really artistic, involuntarily probably, is that he has, uh, that uh, um, uh, Hilma just decided by the spirits, this large, this really decorative um, uh, formats, that, that have an art, for us, for our, um, for uh, a, a beholder of the 21st century has an artistic aspect. Uh, it looks like uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, actually, but it is not. It has a, a, just another context. But but we can transport it into our own um, in, into our own viewing and uh, receiving. The problem is only: is it legitimate that we overscribe it by uh, our meaning? Involuntarily, we do it all the time. But um, do we understand then Hilma of Klimt? We, I, I think as art historians, we have to do both. On one hand, to try to retrace the intentions, and, and on the other hand, we have really to, to analyze ourselves, the kind of Gegenübertragung. What are we projecting into these pictures? And that's, um, I, I think it, in, in this sense, it is really important um, to control ourselves, just as we are in a really rare situation where we are dealing with, with someone who we call now an artist, um, who we, uh, whom we try to, uh, to launch a re-entry into the art system which is um, historically very improbable. It is um, just, I mean, in, in literature, it's possible to, to, to find kind of um, an old manuscript and then you can project your own thinking into the written text. It's easier to combine, um, kind of to, to blend your projection with a text. And it's much, e much more difficult to do it, because um, visual stuff, they, they have really, you see it that, that that's old, that's uh, 100 years old. It, is, it gives a, a sort of a, a batter of just um, um, aesthetic, um, aesthetic um, uh, re reception. But um, uh, that, and one point which, which I would also say, um, in, in a sense, it is between art and alphabet. I, I liked very much your um, um, Hannes um, notion of this spiritual alphabetization. I mean, and that would be something, um, just if we take now the evolution number 13, it looks like an em it is a monumental emblem. You have the um, the Ouroboros um, serpent, you know, that's eternity, the, the kind of the eternal recurrence, which is um, this, uh, this serpent has a, in her mouth, she's carrying two, um, um, two eggs, a blue and a yellow. Blue and yellow, that's uh, um, a female and male, 
this kind of um, what, what uh, Pierre, uh, you address this kind of this kind of uh, um, uh, colors which are on both ends of the uh, of the color theory of of uh, of, uh, of Goethe, and it stands for the the, f the female color of the kind of re re um, re retreating color. It, it is a color which will retreat, while the yellow color, as 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 Goethe writes, it is something protruding. It's, it's something advancing. But but what which is really interesting. Uh, it has been uh, referred several times. Um, it just if I. Um, if I compare it later now with um, um, Pete Mondrian, she remains really in this ambig ambiguity of female and male. You have here on the left-hand side, you have a um, andro androgynous person, um, the male person, which is just uh, ladling something in with a vessel. On the other side, a very strange. I, I, I wrote it is a kind of, um, it is very naturalistically uh, um, um, designed. I see in it kind of a, a, a mixture of a glance and clitoris. Or um, do, I'm, am I wrong? I, I was. I went really very close when I saw. I just wanted to know it because I uh, had to write something in, in in a journal, and I, I couldn't really. But but it would match with this kind of um, um, one, a dual aspect. You you told that that fe male female is something al always intertwined in in her theories, and so so you have this kind of uh, yellow and blue. There are always interconnected, f f male, female aspect. So just to, I mean, that was, um, <laughs> and that's another aspect, um, which, uh, which is uh, typical for a Goethean notion. Uh, it's kind of a phenomenologist view upon the the, uh, the world of appearance, and you have to view through the appearance to the essence. And what she ma makes here, it is just a mother's womb, just turned into an abstract sign of a uh, hold by a Nuroboros serpent. And in the middle is a cross, the vertical and the horizontal. On one hand, it is rosa crucis, yeah, and you have the roses in it, you know. On, on the one hand, it is this, this kind of, but on the other hand, it is also a cliche, which the same, which um, um, Mondrian, in her, his, uh, one of his early work, uh, he, he really problematically hold it, uh, just uh, stated it. The female is horizontal, you know, the, this receiving vessel, and male is is it, 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 it male is kind of vertical. Like, I, I mean, very banal, but I mean, it led to this. <laughs> but but we, we have to, to, to see that's abstraction, uh, and that's one reason because I'm the, I disagree with the formalist. Uh, uh, um, a view of, of um, a, a museum of modern art. You cannot cancel or just to repress this kind of symbolistic heritage out of which abstract art comes. That, that's, that's just um, kind of a, a Geschichtsklitterung because all the big painters of the turn of the century started as, as um, starting with, with, with Kandinsky, with, with, with Mondrian, they started as symbolist painters. And then they turned, they, they put it um, in an abstract way. And I just, you've, I'll show you all this picture you will miss. 
der Affenschädel, der Affenschädel. Uh, I, I come from, from, from Basel and I know how people talked about the Goetheanum. They said uh, that uh, the monkey's crane. And she, they were right because um, uh, um, Rudolf Steiner refers indeed to the monkey because uh, he, he, he edited, uh, he edited uh, the, uh, the, the, in, in the Sophian Ausgabe the, all the writings of Goethe in natural history. And there he knew about the Os um, Intermaxillare Goethei, also the, the, um, the, 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 the Zwischenkieferknochen. I, I, I just wrote it down because that doesn't belong really to my uh, kind of the, uh, premax, uh, premaxilla. That's just what lacks us, assumably. But, but Goethe, just in a sense, uh, just prefiguring, uh, prefiguring even uh, a, um, <clears throat> a, a you, you know it uh, better, uh, uh, Julia, he was prefiguring in a, uh, the origin of species. Uh, just he, he gave ed evidence that also the embryo has this, um, uh, uh, this uh, premaxilla that uh, vanished in, in the process of growing. But what I wanted to say essentially about that, it is just um, a, topo a topos of classic modern receiving of, um, of the world, it is you have to penetrate the world of appearance and come to the essence. And that's uh, at, at the end, I mean, you will miss all that which I have to, would have liked. You see Mondrian and, and Afklint both uh, made marvelous drawings. Um, yes, but we have, that's um, when he have re uh, when he had written Rudolf Steiner's, um, um, uh, no, it was not uh, Rudolf Steiner when he, he, he read the secret doctrine of, uh, of uh, Madame Blavatsky. Then he, he painted that. But um, I have to, this you can read in my book about, um, about the Goethe Arnum, which is built upon the poem of Goethe, um, um, the metamorphosis of plants. And, and there are these seven, um, this, this seven uh, diagrams, diagrammatic uh, pictures, that, that it's the germ then growing, you know, it gets the it leaves, the blossom, and then it turns back to the kernel and goes down to earth. Um, uh, just one, one, please. please. The, the last, let me say, uh, just the last, my last word, I will lead, uh, that's, that's rarely what I, um, I normally I, I like to have the last word, but now I give it to Goethe. And I think that's what uh, what, what all this, um, um, either, um, either of Clint, either Mondrian, I, either uh, Kandinsky, they were referring to this kind of, to, um, to visualize essence through appearance. And, and then in that regard, I quote you the last the last sentence uh, the last the last uh, verses of the metamorphose der plants as you can uh, you can just read it in english after he had this, uh, described this kind of um, evolution of the of the plant from the germ to the blossom and again to the, the germ O gedenke denn auch, wie aus dem Keim der Bekanntschaft nach und nach in uns holde Gewohnheiten spross, Freundschaft sich 
mit Macht aus unserem Innern enthüllte und wie Amor zuletzt Blüten und Früchte gezeugt. You can see that this kind of the, anal the analogy of all beings, that everything, this comparative aspect, which you can translate everything in this sort of metamorphosis and evolution. That are the key words in which you can translate everything and make it um, compatible. Denke wie mannigfach bald die, bald jene Gestalten still entfaltet, Natur unseren Gefühlen geliehen. Freue dich auch des heutigen Tags, die heilige Liebe strebt zu der höchsten Frucht gleicher Gesinnungen auf, gleicher Ansicht der Dinge, damit im harmonischen Anschauen sich verbinde das Paar, finde die höhere Welt. Thank you for your patience. I'm very thankful for Tal Air for your um remarks on love and on naming, um, and also on your remarks for misunderstanding. I think the more we listen to talks, we see how everyone is sort of dribbling with finding categories to which Hilma Aftint might fit or might not fit. And she's more and more this kind of meteorite that crushes into art history and makes sort of categories we have, what's art, what's not art, what's abstract, what's not abstract. Um, What is needed to be included in the canon, what should be left out, is questioning all that. Um, and I would like to make a claim and say that probably loving and naming, you say it's the opposite. I would say in a certain respect it's the same. Um, and I would like you to remind, we are all here now and we have seen this beautiful huge, huge exhibition by Hilma of Klint and somehow we might take that for granted but in fact it's not. For the most time um, being, Hilma of Klint would not be represented in, or would not have a show in a major museum. Um, in fact it was offered or people had ideas to do it in the Moderna Musée and then Pontus Hultin, the founding director of the Moderna Musée, was very strong in claiming that she should not be included and that she should not be shown. I also remember there was, a, I checked this in our archive um, at the newspaper, there was a huge show in Frankfurt on avant-garde and um, occultism and it had um, Kandinsky in there because he was interested in the same spiritual things Hilma of Clint was interested in. Uh, we had Malevich there, um, and also some paintings by Hilma of Clint. And two of the reviews I found totally agreed that the one who was the worst painter in the exhibition was Hilma of Clint. Um, so I would not take what we are doing here and that we all meet here and see, uh, be able to see her works I would not take that for granted. And in naming her work and contextualizing it, in sort of trying to see how it goes with the canon, with whether she has to fit the canon or what, whether we have to reformulate the canon in order to fit Hilma of Clint, is an important task in order to make sure that she will not vanish again um, from art history and not vanish again from the museums. Um, so I have a very practical question because it's not for granted, as I said, that one sh knows the work um, of Hilma of Klint because it's some, it has been shown sometimes, but not often. So where you said you, had, you have liked Hilma of Klint's work for a long time. Well, how did you come across her work? Um, I, I found a catalog called, I think, from Finland and Sweden called Paintings from the Temple. And uh, so I just saw it and you know, As an artist, you steal all the time. You don't even think about it. You just take stuff. And I remember suddenly sitting here when I saw some of these paintings that in early etchings, I took out a lot of this writing. It's kind of a morph writing. So I saw it, I was just attracted. I never had the need to know really anything about it. I just needed her kind of movements. Thank you. Um, then. <laughs> I have a question for you also on the importance of naming. You said, you, I'm still not quite sure whether I have 
um, understood your categories completely. Um, you said so. The, the question is not whether someone has done a um, a mimetic painting, but sort of the the thing we can at least date or is when it was first exhibited and when the claim was made that this is art. If we, let's say, if we, just trying to understand, if we found a letter by Hima of Klint saying to a gallerist, I would like to show my work uh, in a gallery, would that make her the first abstract painter? <laughs> um, my thesis was to say uh, there is no first abstract painter but there is somebody who did invent the discourse about art having to be abstract for the future. This is Kandinsky's stake in 1911. And then the people at that time were really looking for something new. And they had the impression abstraction is really something new. That art that always has been mimetic, all of a sudden is abstract. That's new. And you, you get a kind of a race. Everybody wants to be the one who did the first abstract painting. And they, they really fight almost with each other from 1913 to 1920, with Kandinsky having to say, no, I was the one. And uh, Malevich saying, we are the first ones to really do it. So my point is that, first of all, you'll never find this letter. It would be completely different than everything I understand about Hilma. This letter would have to be, uh, dear gallerist, I just saw paintings by Kandinsky and I'm convinced that I did the same much earlier and much better, so please do an exhibition of my abstract works to show that they are earlier, that they are better. And I think exactly this letter you will not find. But even if you did find it, it still wouldn't make any difference because the letter would be after December 1911. And the works, of course, are, are earlier, but the idea of changing the discourse about what is new art, this is, I think, the fundamentally new idea of Kandinsky. And on this level, Kandinsky is rather a conceptual artist who has new ideas than a good painter. I think he was a good painter as well, but uh, it wouldn't have to be both at the same time. I wonder whether this is, Kandinsky certainly is a conceptual artist, but whether this isn't also a very conceptual way of telling art history. Because um, I would totally agree if we turn to a mimetic painting, and you have shown this beautifully in your exhibition, there is no first. But that doesn't mean that chronology is unimportant. Um, so, by, for example, I've written in my articles that she was prior to Gendinsky, which is not making, we should, saying, you know, we should worship her because she's the first, but it's just saying she is prior, she has done sort of, it's an independent path to a form of painting um, that we now able to see. Um, and, and in fact, if we look at Kandinsky's path to doing this kind of, trying to paint the unseen, then she, what uh, Hilma of Klint is trying to do and uh, Kandinsky is trying to do is very similar, although they look um, very different, but it's sort of a similar path. And I wonder whether it's, um, whether we really need the artist sort of to label for us what they are doing or whether we, you know, we can look back and worship um, that there are different paths and that there is a history of doing something sort of um, different from the Renaissance tradition we should be interested in. Just, just a, a, a tip. I, I think I would really um, support your, um, um, I mean, chronology is, 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 is important, that's true. But I, I think probably one could, the Gordian not, but probably we, we can cut it by telling it is the curatorial act. Because if, if you ab abstract science, also in art, there are so all, you can, Alexandre, uh, Alexander Cousins in, in the 18th century, uh, then you, um, as, as you, uh, um, um, Gustave Moreau, Les, les Ebauches, um, 
that's, that's something which goes back to the Leonardo topos of uh, the Macchia, um, uh, of, of, uh, of the, the, uh, the, the spot on the, uh, the pro um, the, the spot on the wall, and then you can imagine something true. That, that's a very old topic. But I think it is the curatorial act to decide, I want to exhibit that as a purpose. I, and I think it is the same thing with Hilma of Klint, by the way. When, 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 uh, they, they, um, when the, the, Swedish, the Swedish owners they are lucky to, to, to re-enter re her, her work into the art system, then it is thanks to a curatorial act. I mean, that's, that's one of these curatorial acts to show this kind of theosophic uh, mandalas in an, art, um, in an art exhibition. That's already a first step. I think you have uh, the, the, the curatorial act, that's, that's the the essence of, of declaring something to be um, kind of uh, a, uh, a, a, an object of, of exhibition. So the curator should have the word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, as we see, uh, Hilma of Clint is quite a complex uh, case. Um, as we know, she's trained as an artist. She studied at the Art Academy for more than five years. So uh, she's not a self-taught uh, um, artist. Um, all her life was about picture making. Uh, there was a kind of picture making in the tradition of naturalist art she was trained in. And then she continues to make uh, images, but they were um, mostly non-figurative. And to say, to label them that they are not art is to me very, very strange. Is it possible that an artist, and in the telephone catalog, she was very, um, um, uh, I mean, she was like listing herself up as artist Hilma of Klint. So is that really reasonable to think that an artist makes art to a certain point, and then the art, artist makes images, but we decide that these images are not art? I think this is like interpreting it far too much. Uh, so uh, to me, to my understanding, the whole project of Hilma of Klint was an artistic project. And to label the um, abstract works as only mandalas is taking it very, very, I mean, not far enough. Mm -hmm. And what, what we all um, see when we go through the exhibition, and we have the possibility to do this until 8 o'clock, I guess, uh, we are really uh, taken by the size of the works, and we know the spirit told her to, to make them in that size, but she followed also that. And even if images come through somebody as a medium, I mean, she was <laughs> doing these works, and you see that it's a trained artist who did this. I mean, there's composition, and there's a balance, and there's so much which, um, like untrained individual wouldn't be capable of doing. And um, so the magic is much more complicated, we, we feel, in these works. Um, yeah, would you like to say something, Paul? I mean, it might have been Kadinsky who crossed the line. But what, what, what a banal way he did it. I mean, still, when you look at his work, he's so bound to gravity to what's up, what's down, what is the landscape. So it might be he was the first man on the dance floor, but what a clumsy dancer. <laughs> yeah, I would like to add that uh, uh, maybe we know for sure that Hilma Klint belongs to the contemporary discussion, thanks to these exhibitions. Mm -hmm. And that is not very, I mean, that's quite common that you see that you have an artist who has his, her, or his main legacy, many, many, sometimes hundreds of years later before these works are made. And I would also say that if we, um, if we would put a label on from where comes the artistic impulses and reject all those artists who are not properly uh, clean in this sense, we would have to take away maybe half of the uh, artists that we are showing in the exhibitions in our art museums. It's very, very difficult to get into and try to 
uh, classify what are correct and what are not so correct artistic impulses. And I agree with Iris completely that it was, it's completely sure when you read Hilma Klint's work that uh, she is considering herself an artist. Not this megalomanic, Teutonian, self-expressionist artist, but a mediator, but somebody that is able to paint, as I said, the cosmic truth. That is why her proper, her, uh, she has this paradoxical, uh, um, how to say, uh, she, she is grandiose in a really humble way, which remains of the very early female saints. Hingelikard of Ibingen, for instance, she is saying, I'm nothing, I'm absolutely nothing, but through me blows, uh, blows the wind of God. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, Clint is the same. Mm. I only want to add something you already mentioned before. You mentioned that uh, it was, her work was not about her ego. And this is something um, we mostly don't think about. We, we are like so used to that artists uh, show their egos and that it's about ego, that I did this, and I'm better than you, and I'm more important, and my prices are like higher than yours. And it's, it, it's maybe very male, and Hilma Clint was not interested in that. I mean, only imagine somebody made these, all these works we see in the exhibition, and she stipulates in her last will that they shouldn't be shown before 20 years after she passed away. So she was, I mean, she knew that she would never get the credit for that, and she could take this because it was not about um, hiring her, her ego through, through getting recognition, but it was important that the images were there because I really, I, I said this before, but I really think that she believed in the power of the image, and if we say this is art or not art, and this is this and this is that, I think her way of making images is far beyond that. So, so. Isn't, oh, that, uh, too, <laughs> it, isn't that generally too correct? I, I mean, <laughs> no, I, probably I not much more to say. <laughs> but um, I, I just want to add to this discussion that part of the discussion was based on the assumption that there is the one canonical art history, and that um, we ask whether she's part of it or not. And I think this is the wrong question, because uh, before asking, probably asking this question again, we have to question the, the registers in which art history comes, uh, which is only almost the same you said before. <laughs> I may just add on that I'm absolutely uh, of the same opinion. I never, never said she's not an artist. I, I never, never said, said she would do mandalas. And the but point said, is, <laughs> she's an extraordinary artist, but she's not an abstract artist in the sense Kandinsky defined abstraction, and in the sense art history has taken over his stance. And I think the problem is exactly what you said, that we just believe that the 20th century is the century where abstract art had to come, because Hegel is still somewhere in the back of our mind, and we think that history is going on directed by the Weltgeist, and the Weltgeist, in the form of Kandinsky, decided that the 20th century is abstract. Uh, uh, would you like to short? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, just, just because I am accused of having de de denigrated these works as pure mandalas, I, I, I didn't say, I, I mean, I, I consider Hilma of Klint to be a, a great artist. Just she, she really stand, holds it with, with Joseph Beuys in, 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 in the West Wing. I, I mean, that, that you have to... Uh, you, you have to manage that. I, I think this works, they, 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 they make it. So, uh, but um, what I see, and just, I, I, what I, I think it's sort of a gender cliche that we, women don't like to go so kind of uh, forward. That, that's a, a little bit cliche in the sense of, 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 of Goethe, that uh, a, a female is a, a blue color, just a, retiring always, shrinking always, while men are kind of aggressive yellow. I mean, that's, that's just not also in, uh, not in the sense of Hilma of Clint, who saw always this kind of ambiguity in, in, all, of, in all creatures. I mean, and that, that's one of her um, uh, lessons 
she, she gave, she, gave, she gives visual images, very important. I, I mean, autopoiesis, uh, to make your, to make a self, that, that, that's an essential gesture in art. And uh, 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 are they uh, uh, female or male? May I only very, very short respond to that? Uh, I, I don't think we, we, um, we understand Hilma of Klint correctly if we say she, she was so simple that there was this male and this female uh, no, absolute <laughs> way of being. But I think it was very much about that we are living in a polarized world. There's day and night and there's female and male. And, and I mean, we can only... Um, understand this world by, by navigating through these two extremes and I think a lot of, I mean her work is about mapping that and, and, and trying to, to communicate that this is our perception of reality here but maybe if we would be able to open the curtain and part of her work she's talking about is about that, then we would see that polarity is only an illusion and behind that there's oneness so, so in that sense, it's not like that there's only black or white. Uh, so so that I wanted to say this before we open maybe okay. the questions. To we have only some minutes left, but um, I don't like the sort of speaking in front of a silenced audience. To get it from the very emotional, metaphysical level, probably to a more art historical level. Um, if I remember right, the initial question was, uh, the influences, um, the color theoretical influences that uh, Hema of Klint was exposed to. Um, I would like to know about this, if there's like, as far as research has it by now, is there any, anything you can say about the influences, like the color theoretical influences she was exposed to during her probably studies in university and also later times, especially uh, um, in the 19, around 1900, early 20th century, before she started doing the non-figurative so-called abstract or whatever you want to label it, paintings. Thanks. Now, as far as I know, she didn't start, I mean, she was a member of the Theosophical Society, a group which called Edelweiss. Mm. Uh, she was, of course, a trained professional painter, but if you read through her diaries, you would see that she was, uh, she was getting uh, quite elaborate visions around how the colors were connected to each other. So she herself considered that she got this, um, this information in an intuitive way. And I would say something, talking about color theory here, I think that what is striking is that she is so little depending on color theory. If you look upon uh, some of the combinations, like pale, pale, pink, pale blue and yellow, which are in the works from 1907, something like that. It's a highly uh, unexpected, interesting and daring color combination. So I, I would say that she is, um, the colors are spiritually uh, important for her, very, very important. And she sees the world in this kind of sounding chromatic aspect, but uh, I don't think she consciously at least was influenced by color theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with what you say. I only want to add, there's one um, very interesting image in, or painting in the exhibition, and in and, and this you say, in, see a naked person, and you see the, the chakras marked. And what is very interesting, if you look at the color of the chakras, I mean, for her, I think color was also energy. If you look at the colors of the chakra, they start from the lowest with red, and then orange, and yellow, and green, and uh, blue and yeah. So, and if you look at uh, Helena Blavatsky's uh, 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 writings, and if you look at frequencies, how this is like, uh, I mean, the frequency of the chakras, then you would see they are like exactly the same today, and she couldn't know this in, in her time. So, I think this is quite interesting. So, yeah. Up this, I somehow brought up this question, how can we relate her uh, works to existing color theories or color systems, because it's so striking that color plays a very strong role and that she has these um, circles with the colors, and um, uh, I thought maybe not to find out uh, by which color theory 
she is influenced by or which we can trace in her diaries, but uh, I'm just interested to contextualize her works in existing color system, color, uh, ideas about colors, and I think this is just a starting point to do that. Uh, we proposed we should look into Goethe, but I think one should also look into Runge or other artists that have a very strong uh, idea and also systematics about color. So I think this is really a starting um, conversation, how to contextualize uh, this work in respect to the colors she used, uh, next to the meaning she herself gave to the colors she used. My name is uh, Johan of Klint, and um, <clears throat> Uh, Hilma, if you know, when we made up her estate, she had zero crowns in her estate when she died. But she managed to keep all this intact. Why? Because there was something to the s uh, sketches for the temple series, the first 193 page, uh, paintings, that she tried all her life to find an answer to. And it is my duty as um, an ancestor, uh, as, as a uh, her relative, to see to it that we now start a serious um, uh, research for what these um, paintings were about, what the meaning is. And for this, I'm very thankful for the uh, uh, foundation that you have had this um, seminar, because that is one step towards this purpose. And I'm very thankful, and I give the thanks from the family and the foundation. Now to the question. Uh, Iris, you always almost answered it. I mean, several of you have talked about duality, about yellow and blue, about uh, man and woman and so on, and about the mandala, the mandala concept. Uh, and I think that Hilma used this as illustrating that everything is a unity. It's like a Buddhism that you have samsara and nirvana to say that everything is one. And this I would like to pose to you, is this a right interpretation or is it a, a, a facetious question? Well, thank you very much, Johan. Um, I think that in my client, well, I'm in the middle, I must say, of these incredibly abundantly rich uh, material which are in the diaries. But uh, it seems as if one of the fantastic aspects of Hilma Klein's thinking is that it's incredibly dynamic. So on one hand, you have, of course, the unity, the Buddhist unity. But on the other hand, you have this kind of whirling, um, how, to, how to say, there, there is a, there is, it's not dialectical, but it's dualistic, her thinking. And what is even more fascinating is that she is changing her thinking. For instance, when she is all of a sudden 1913 saying, Actually, I was wrong. It wasn't blue, which means female, yellow, which is male. It was the other way around. I think this is an example of a very vivid mind or a vivid spirit who is able to say, I misunderstood something here, and let's take it again. And one more thing, and that is that something that normally you would say in these, for instance, in theosophical thinking, you would always say that black is a kind of evil aspect. Hilma Clint was not saying that. She said that black is darkness, passion, and waiting. So she was giving her own understandings of a lot of um, assumptions that others had. I would like to give the word to you, and then last question, and then we close. I hope we will never know, <laughs> because then there will be mo no more talks like this. I think the purpose is to keep to, to have the mystery, and maybe there doesn't exist an answer. And I think there's a big, big difference between having a certain topic as a motif. It's like you have a reason for a certain killing. And she had a certain motif. She was moving towards it, not to solve it, but just as something you're hunting. 
You know, the day you catch it, then you become a religious person and you are out of art. So I think the beauty is she never caught it. She was just searching. And the beauty comes from searching, not from finding. Okay, then I thank you very much for coming. Thank you.